So it's Tuesday, August 9th, 2022, and I'm on Interstate 580, eastbound from the San Francisco Bay Area, heading towards Castle Air Museum in Atwater, California, down in the uh, Central Valley. going the other direction. I always kind of like going through these hills. I forget what their name is. I'll have to look it up later. But I'm just providing this as a little bit of ambiance before the museum visit. I actually catch a lot of grief from YouTube commenters that hate it when I show ambiance before visits to various places but I think it's important to have it you know otherwise if I just show the museum then people have no idea of what to expect is it in the middle of a city is it out in the country you know is it far from other places without the ambiance you can't really tell plus it's just a bit of pretty scenery All the times I've been in this part of California, I don't remember ever seeing these hills any color than brown. I don't know if they are ever green or if brown is their natural color. coming the other way. Jeez. Glad I'm not going that direction. In one and a quarter miles, keep left to I-205. get to drive on this for a while. This is uh, Highway 120. I think it's California Highway 120. And then we depart from 120 and get going on, I think it's California Highway 99. This, as I recall, is a very unlovely highway. Actually, I'm not sure there are any highways in this part of the state that are more than just functional. Usually a lot of traffic in my experience and uh, just kind of, you know, when I was a kid there was a book I loved called Go Dog Go. It was just a bunch of dogs in cars tearing around and uh, I'm th always put in mind of that book when I travel on these highways in Central California. So we're just swinging past the well-known city of Modesto, California, still on Highway 99 and southbound. There's some sort of orchards off on the side there. A lot of that's in this area. A huge amount of crops of all sorts are grown here. 
mostly through irrigation, I think. I, mean, I don't think they get a ton of rain here. Uh, irrigation canals that come down from the mountains. And I kind of wonder how that's doing with everything drying out. After about an hour of that, finally get off. Do a little local traveling here now, but I include all this just because uh, it's useful to have some idea where these places are. Lots of orchards down there and other crops. At the end of the street, turn right. So now we're just driving through the local burg. I'm not sure if this is Atwater or an adjacent town. Lots of groves, or not groves really, just orchards really. Getting close now. Continue on North Santa Fe Drive. picturesque rail bridge over here. Which I had to double back so I could see again. Definitely weren't in Atwater earlier. It was uh, further from the destination than I thought. Some of the airplanes at this museum have been brought on, on trains right down these tracks here. Okay, just finally crossed over into the uh, town of Atwater. Of and right on the oh, left is the museum. Santa Fe Drive on the left. 5050 Santa Fe Drive.
one quarter mile. Arrive at 5050 Santa Fe Drive on the left. <laughs> Still thinks it's a quarter mile away. So right off the parking lot of the Castle Air Museum, we have an SR-71. And we have one of the uh, DC-9 variants that was used as a uh, presidential transport. And then we have the main building. There's also a couple buildings behind that. And then the main air park which we can only just see a little bit of here. The downside to this museum, nice as it is, is that uh, the planes are out in the elements and it's not like the Pima Air and Space Museum where it's the very arid climate. I don't think they get a ton of rain here, but uh, it's still um, not an ideal location for preserving aircraft. All right, so the entry fee is $20 for adults, 15 if you're a senior, and I forget what it is for kids. Something less, obviously. Um, the museum grounds in that direction ends right there where there's some other facility in their chain link fence and parking area. And uh, they used to give these out for free, but now you can pay $2 to get their, their map, or you can scan a QR code and get a similar map on your phone. Over there is a North American AT-6 Texan. And right here we've got a Boeing B-17G. Flying Fortress, marked up as Virgin's Delight. So there's a lot of ways you can wander around in here. This time I'm going to try to take the, uh, the order that the, the map has it going. So we've got a consolidated B-24M Liberator. World War II bomber. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a big multi-track railway going past here. And uh, that's how they've gotten some of the aircraft in here is bring them in in pieces on rail cars and then just uh, bring them across the highway. Okay, back to the B-24. And there's one going the other direction. Like I said, multi-track. Over here we have another Boeing product, the uh, KC-97. Strato freighter, which of course is an aerial tanker. It has the flying um, boom on the back. Here we have a Douglas B-23 Dragon, another kind of bomber, not a terribly popular one. I don't recall how 
how many of these they made. But I don't think it was a, a whole ton of them. And over here, one of my favorites, the Avro Vulcan B Mark II nuclear bomber from jolly old England. They used to let you walk around underneath these, but it seems like they gradually chain them off a little bit more. I'll get some of these guys when I loop back around. Here we have a one of the military variants of the Lockheed Constellation. Uh, I think Super Connie, actually. This is the uh, EC-121 Warning Star. So it has all the big radars on it. These guys aren't on the map, at least not in the position they are now. This is a uh, observation airplane. Um, it's, I think, the O2, O2A. I know they operated these in Vietnam. It has the pusher and the tractor propellers, two engines. Pretty good performance. Uh, I want to say it's made by Cessna. It also has underwing um, ordnance capabilities. You can they can drop small bombs and flares and what have you. So it has some armament, but I think these were used primarily as uh, spotters to you know hover over areas and call in fighters with bigger bombs and so on. And I think they could also be used um, uh, to help uh, downed pilots get rescued. Matter of fact, I wonder if this is the kind that was used in that movie Bat 21. Now this seems to me to be a de Havilland, but again I'm not positive. This is marked uh, on the on the platform is a U-6. Is that just a beaver? Um, again, I can't remember. And I think this is one of those blue canoes. Is that the U-3? Again, I'm not sure, but... Uh, small executive transport and utility aircraft. Going back to the warning star there. Boy, that guy is a pregnant, isn't it? <laughs> Jeez.
This is supposed to be fairly new here. They put a couple of new pads out that look like they're brand new. Is that a, uh, again, helicopters are not my bag baby, but uh, is that a Cobra? I don't know, maybe I'll find out later. It doesn't have any signage. They do have some of the benches out here. This is something I've seen at the Dover Museum where they've got uh, metal benches with, you know, laser cut names of the airplanes that they're near, but there's only a few of those around here. This is a Lockheed uh, Lodestar, I think. Yeah, C-56 Lodestar combination cargo transport aircraft. And over here we've got a North American T-39 Sabre Liner. This guy here is a Boeing CH-47D Chinook dual rotor cargo and utility helicopter. Troop transport all sorts of roles. Yeah, those uh, aircraft over there we were looking at earlier those were relocated here from where they put these new pads in for the helicopters. So just confirming that that guy is a de Havilland Canada L-20 Beaver, otherwise known as the U-6. And the guy that I was referring to as being a spotter aircraft, that's a Cessna O-2A Super Skymaster observation aircraft. And as I guessed uh, correctly, this guy over here is the Cessna U3A, known as the Blue Canoe. So we're back to the, uh, the T-39 Sabre liner here. And this is going to be a Black Hawk, although in the Navy livery it probably has a different name, but there's no signage out here for it. And then again, the, uh, the Cobra or whatever this thing is. One of these days I'll get some signage out here or update their map. We'll see these guys again later. There's a Hustler and B-52, C-47, all that good stuff. We'll come back to those. So we've got this Curtis Commando here, the C-46D. Always one of my favorites from here. Don't see a lot of these in museums. And I think this is a Beach YT-34 Mentor uh, primary trainer. Or maybe it's a secondary trainer, I'm not sure. A trainer anyway. And over here is a Cayman HH-43B Husky. 
intermeshing dual rotor, tail rotorless utility helicopter used a lot for uh, medevac and also I believe for firefighting at airports or air bases. And this is a Beach C-45 Expediter, the military version of the Twin Beach. I have a uh, video where I took a flight on one of these, uh, part of the Commemorative Air Force. Always did like the Twin Beach. A lot of these still flying. And the Douglas C-47 Skytrain. Marked up here with the invasion stripes. So it's kind of marked for uh, D-Day, I think. These were, of course, cargo and troop transport and medevac and a million other things. And over here we have a Lockheed F-94 Starfire. And here we have a Lockheed P-80B or F-80B Shooting Star fighter. Walking past the buff. guy over there telling his wife that that's a B-1. It's a hustler. I shouldn't be too critical of other people. Very few people have a completely encyclopedic knowledge of airplanes on first sight. And then when it comes to the F-Series fighters, I always have to look these up because I just don't know them. This should be... A Republic F-84F Thunderstreak. And that guy is a Republic F-84C Thunderjet. Going past the B-47. Come back to that later. A lot of dragonflies are around here. And this is a North American F-86H Sabre. And this is a Northrop F-89J Scorpion. Again, we'll come back to these guys on the right later on. And this is a Lockheed T-33 Shooting Star, primarily a jet trainer, I think. And over here in black livery is a Northrop T-38 Talon. A lot of the large jet iron is back here. One of the few B-36s on display anywhere.
taken a cue here from the um, the boneyard near Tucson, Amarg Boneyard, where they've ostensibly got a stealth fighter set up here. Once you've got four tires and a ladder, it's kind of easy to present that joke. One thing I hadn't noticed before is that they faked the uh, hold down chains pretty nicely here. Somebody put a little extra work into that. Stealth fighter, yep. Okay, this guy here is a McDonald F4E Phantom II. And uh, this is a MiG-21 fighter. And back here is a General Dynamics FB-111, FB-111 Aardvark. The heads. Looks like they're uh, more permanent. <laughs> Restrooms are out of service. They've got the temporary guys in here. It should be a North American F-100 Super Saber. So I think I already got the F-100 here. The Super Saber. This is a Martin EB-57A Canberra, made under license from uh, England. And this is a McDonnell F-101 Voodoo. And this is a Vought RF-8G Crusader. It's a naval aircraft, usually carrier-based. And here we have a Grumman F-14D Tomcat. And a Douglas a4 Skyhawk. And here's a Lockheed F-104B Starfighter. Here's a Republic F-105 Thunder Chief fighter bomber. And a um, Douglas R-5D-4 Skymaster cargo aircraft. Basically a version of the DC-4. And I think that guy there is a Convair F-106 Delta Dart. It's got that Convair look to it. We'll verify that when I get closer. And this is a Fairchild C-119C flying boxcar. One of my favorites. I always maintain that if I was in the Air Force at the time when these were operating, this would probably be my first choice of aircraft to serve on. 
I like the function, I like the design, I like the appearance. Simple, solid, utilitarian, but it got some pretty cool missions. This is the Douglas RA-3 Sky Warrior. Northrop Grumman EA-6B Prowler. That's uh, electronic warfare and attack. And this should be a North American RA-5C Vigilante. Reconnaissance attack bomber. I always just love the looks of this airplane. Very powerful and super sleek. The lines are just great on it. I never got the impression that these were super popular, but I may be mistaken on that. You don't, I don't see a lot of them mentioned or shown. But look at the front end of that. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Great big airplane. Some room for expansion back there. And here we have a Lockheed MC-130P Transport Special Operations version of the C-130. Perk's another bird I would have liked to have served on. One thing this area has is tons and tons of anthills. I think they're always knocking them down. On past visits, I've seen a lot of them just everywhere. But there's still some in evidence around here. Looks like some sort of, what is that, some kind of radar? I'm not sure. Okay, this guy over here is a Grumman S2 tracker. It's a uh, anti-submarine aircraft, primarily. And I'm not sure this thing is marked. It's on a fairly new looking pad, so it's probably fairly recent. It looks like one of those portable control tower or meteorological facilities. Um, it probably has a generator in there and some antennas and good stuff. They don't have it marked though as to what it is. So this is a Convair model 240 known as the T29 also known as the C-131A. It's Coast Guard aircraft. And over here is a Grumman SA-16 Albatross, mostly a rescue craft, I believe. And this over here is a McDonnell Douglas F-15A Eagle. And our friend the B-36 again.
And here we have a General Dynamics F-16A Fighting Falcon. That guy there is indicated on the map as a rascal, and that should be a GAM-63. One nice thing about this uh, B-36 here is unlike other ones in museums, the B-36 was armed, although unlike, you know, World War II aircraft, it wasn't exactly bulging with guns that you could see, but here at Castle they've got the top, one of the top hatches open, and a pretty serious looking cannon sticking out there. So there's more of that on these airplanes. They actually are pretty well armed. So anyway, um, this guy here is the Convair RB36H Peacemaker. I'm trying to remember where this one came from. Yeah, so um, I was scratching my head for a moment, and this was the same B-36 that used to be at the Chanute Air Force Base in Rantoul, Illinois. Uh, and it was one of the lucky aircraft to escape that place without just being scrapped. Um, I remember that was quite a production that they had to uh, take it all apart and ship it here. Um, I want to say on rail cars, like I said before, I think this is one of the ones that came in by train, but I don't know that for a fact. It would have to be no wider than rail cars could be. I'm not sure about the fuselage. Maybe part of it came by other means. On the other hand, it's not really that wide of an aircraft. Maybe it could fit as long as they took the fuselage apart in sections. So um, the RB-36H was a strategic reconnaissance version of the B-36. There were, of course, a lot of variations on the airplane. They're uh, doing some restoration now at this point, probably giving it another coat of paint. It really needs it. Uh, one of the things that happens to these guys is there's a lot of magnesium on it that uh, tends to corrode away pretty quickly once if it's out in a damp environment. Um, so here's one of the reconnaissance tricks they have, these sliding doors that expose a uh, a window with a camera, a uh, powerful camera behind it, and in this case a big wasp nest. It's hard to keep those things from being around unless you just cover the, plant, the entire aircraft with insect netting or bird netting and so on. So this guy wouldn't have been used to drop bombs, this particular model. But since it was a B-36 that has the bomb bays, this aircraft is pretty much empty um, and probably always was from the factory. There's a lot of uh, things inside that wouldn't be necessary for the role this particular model served. Now I have been inside this aircraft. I came out here once uh, many years ago specifically because it was open cockpit day and the promise was you could get to go inside the B-36. And uh, uh, as it turned out it had rained heavily the night before and they decided to cancel open cockpit day because 
just getting in and out of the planes was considered too risky with wet ladders and wet shoes and so on. But when they heard I made a trip from Chicago to, uh, to see it, the curator opened it up, put a sign out saying maintenance was going on so other people wouldn't come dashing over. That was very nice of him. And we got on and um, I don't actually know if it was the curator or somebody who worked here um, set it up so I did able, was able to go inside this aircraft, uh, really just in the front part of it. Pretty much everything forward of the wing as I recall. So I think this is one I walked by going the other direction. And this should be a McDonnell F4E Phantom 2. So it's kind of where we came in down there. We've already walked a big loop around that way and come back. So now I can start talking about these guys on the left side. This is a Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker. And once again, it has the flying boom in the rear. This is a variant of the 707. One of the few places you can get a good close-up look at the flying boom. There's our stealth fighter again. Marked high-speed boom. So it has sort of the V-tail type wings on it that allow it to fly this part of it around, up, down, left, and right. And then you've got the long telescoping boom that telescopes through that thing. And then finally the, um, at least part of the nozzle assembly. I think it may be missing something there. Something to help it dock, but... I wouldn't be surprised if they took it off as people are stealing it or maybe somebody just stole it. I'm not sure. That winch there looks kind of jury rigged, so that's probably not part of the normal equipment. Something they rigged up here at the museum just to display it. And airplanes like this uh, can be tail heavy and can tip back pretty easily. So they've got this uh, post put in here to kind of prevent that from happening. It looks like kind of a shock absorber that would uh, dampen its travel once it's being brought back up and then locked into place up here when not in use. <clears throat> and there's the uh, compartment, the bulge where the the operator of the flying boom sort of lays in a prone position and he's got his window there to look down on the plane that's getting refueled. Oh, there's a good view of the guns on the B-36. We can see two different, uh, two different gun assemblies up there.
this is one we came by the other direction. This is a B-47 Stratojet made by Boeing. In some ways kind of a proof of concept for the B-52. Also a transitional airplane between the B-36 and the B-52. And over here is a Cessna T-37B, that's called the Tweety Bird, it's a twin-engine jet trainer, but it's used by, um, what do they call themselves, the Snowbirds, the Canadian Precision Aerobatic Team, they use, I think, this kind of aircraft. Perfectly capable airplanes, but they're not fighters, but they can do pretty decent aerobatics. As I recall, these guys have quite an annoying shriek to them when they're operating. And now we've got the Boeing B-52D Stratofortress. I think this is just a fuel tank, pretty big one. And you've got these uh, <clears throat> training wheels <laughs> way out on the ends of the wings. Um, the wings are pretty floppy, especially when they're fully fuel loaded. And with the um, bicycle type landing gear, uh, it wouldn't take much for the airplane to tip some and it needs some sort of an outrigger here to uh, keep the end of the wing from just hitting the runway. You can see how thin the wing is out at this point. There's just barely enough room to fold this mechanism up with its uh, landing gear door and tuck the, uh, the wheel in there just on the other side of the skin, the top skin that is. And then it has the other door there. They don't let you crawl around under the wheel wells of this guy anymore like they used to. They've been making a lot of improvements here about where they want people to go and where they don't. And here we have a Convair B-58 Hustler, which we touched on on the way past. Looks like they don't have all the engines on it yet. They've got the inner pods, but not the outer pods, and those are sitting down on the ground right now. I don't recall if they had this guy here when I was here last, or if they're just doing some restoration on it, that it's sort of discombobulated. And I think I already hit the North American T-39 Sabre liner coming in the other direction. Now we have this group of aircraft up here. Uh, we already looked at the Lockheed C-56 Lodestar from the rear, coming past uh, the Connie and so on. And I already mentioned how I like the uh, Fairchild uh, C-119 
flying box car a while back when we walked past it. Um, but a relative of it is the Fairchild C123K provider. Kind of like the same thing but smaller. There's the Lodestar again. This is a Saab J35 TF35 Draken, or Draken? Draken, I, I suspect. Uh, was that Swedish? Fighter Interceptor Attack Aircraft. And this is an Avro Canada CF100 uh, Mark V Canuck. I think we already touched on that guy, probably from the rear. And over here we've got another one of those weird fill-in-the-gaps aircraft, the Douglas B-18 Bobo. I don't remember the history on that. It seemed like it was based on another Douglas aircraft. Um, I don't want to say it was the DC-2 or something. I don't know. Maybe it had some parts in common. I just don't remember. So over here we have a Boeing WB-50 Super Fortress. This is the uh, gussied up, followed up to the B-29 with uh, much improved engines and a lot of other things that a lot of people maintain that this is just a tweaked B-29, but everything I've read says that even though the basic shape is the same, so much of it's different that it really should be called its own thing, not a, a tweak of an earlier model. Just one thing off the top of my head that's different is that the, C, uh, the B-29 had a castering nose gear. It could not be steered, whereas the uh, B-50 type, like this one, has a steerable nose wheel. And there's just myriad things that are different. Much more reliable engines, more powerful, faster, etc. And this is a North American B-45A Tornado. It's a bomber. And there's a Douglas A-26B Invader. And here's a Boeing B-29. Again, related, but not a copy of the B-50. The B-29, this one's marked up as Raisin Hell. And there's a North American B-25J Mitchell. And a Volti BT-13 Valiant, another trainer. And then a, the Boeing uh, B-17G Flying Fortress, which we saw coming in. One of the first aircraft on this little walkthrough. back to the B-24. That's all the airplanes that are outside. So we have this uh, secondary building. This is mostly just the museum entrance and gift shop here. There's nothing else in it. There's a Cessna 
uh, 150 here, otherwise the T-51 A in military lingo. This thing out here is just the uh, nose of a, a B-52 that is set up so you can look at it from the inside. So, so no aircraft in this secondary building, but a lot of uh, smaller details. We're going to go out and take a look at these couple of other aircraft on the other side of the parking lot. And I'm going to hustle because there's a chance I might still barely make it to the Jimmy Doolittle Museum at Travis Air Force Base. Looks like they're in the process of building the Castle Air Museum Memorial Brick Park. It looks like a lot of it's still maybe a little bit incomplete, I'm not sure. They've got the cinder block up here, but I have a suspicion that what they plan to do is cover it with engraved brick faces. Like all of these. As mentioned before, a Lockheed SR-71A Blackbird. I love that they've got one of these, but I also don't like that it has to sit outside in the weather and get all dirty and grungy. They definitely have fixed this up. The last time I was here it was just like this underneath. They've put a walkway around it, got the gravel. It doesn't look like they're letting anybody go into this guy today, so we'll just see it from the outside. Presidential aircraft, you have to do uh, uh, 
tours. They may charge extra for that, I'm not sure. They used to have a, uh, a little restaurant in here with, you know, a few tables where you could get simple things like hot dogs and grilled cheese sandwiches and things like that, which I always appreciated, but the last couple of times at least I've been here, that's been closed and it doesn't seem like they're using it anymore. on my way to the Travis Air Museum, otherwise known as the Jimmy Doolittle uh, Air Museum, Aviation Museum, whatever it is. Had a good visit here at Castle. Took the whole morning for me. But in reality, you can get through it in a couple hours if you're mostly looking at just the outdoor exhibits.